All right, my English teacher friends, and especially my friends that love to teach rhetorical analysis. I got a good one up my sleeve today, especially for all you Swifties. I have looked around on the YouTube channels, and it looks like no one has done an assignment yet using Taylor Swift's NYU commencement. And I'm always looking to create new lesson plans and new material. So I'm like, hey, why not? I'll Bob Ross this one for you guys. And I'm basically going to start with an empty canvas and paint my way through the entire essay while pulling the strings of my heuristics. With that said, let's talk about where you can locate this commencement address. So I'm referring to the NYU one. You can just go to YouTube and play it for your kids a few times. So in my class, we listen to it three times. And then on my YouTube channel, there's a link to the actual written transcript. And then there's also a link that contains the slides that you see featured in this presentation. So have at it. It's all free. Help yourself. Please subscribe if you haven't yet and uh, click that like button. So give me some love. So I mentioned Bob Rossing my instruction. And here's what I mean by that. There's a fundamental difference between the assigning of writing and the direct explicit teaching. So for years, I've peddled around the following question. What if we taught composition like Bob Ross teaches painting? And if we do that, we get to our blank canvas, our blank easel, and we fill it all up, right? We fill it all up for our students. We paint with and for our students. We position ourselves as the expert writers in the classroom. But here's the kicker, my friends. Bob Ross used a heuristic known as the wet on wet technique. And I use heuristics for our introductory paragraphs. I use something called the inverted and declarative model. And since this is rhetorical analysis, we're going to declare and I'll model that for you in just a second. And then all body paragraphs, I use a heuristic known as the syllogistic method. So strap in and uh, sit up right and we'll, uh, we'll go through it from top to bottom. So our canvas is empty. And we immediately ask ourselves the question, how do I write the introductory paragraph? And it's really not that difficult because if we make a prompt a la College Board and, um, you know, just kind of steal the template of their, of their language, which I always do for my prompts for rhetorical analysis if I make them on my own. If you go back all the way to like the 1970s, there's kind of a cheat or a hack uh, that I do for my students. Implicit in the language of all College Board rhetorical analysis prompts, so I'm talking FRQ2, you have two questions. What is the author's intent and how does the author construct meaning? And what my students do is this. We read it and we go terms and devices hunting, right? We go looking for all the little nuance, all the machinations, all, all, everything that, uh, you know, Taylor Swift is doing uh, on a rhetorical level. And then what we do is this. We take three sentences to answer the question, how does the author construct meaning? And then we take one sentence to answer what is the author's intent. And when I ask that question, sometimes teachers will say it this way. What's the exigence? What's the universal theme? What's the universal truth? Uh, however you want to cloak or, or, or phrase that question is your own making. So we're going to do three sentences. How does the author construct meaning? And we're going to use our terms, our devices, our techniques. So I always read things with students early beginning of the year and just kind of put their nose in the devices, the techniques, and uh, you know the, the terms just so that they're reading properly and I model how to read. So I call it term device technique hunting. And then as I alluded to, we always use the declarative. Here's the reason why, and we'll look at it graphically for a second. So it looks like a triangle. When you begin with the thesis, 
you're answering the question, how does the author construct meaning? So I tell my students, go with like the most salient, the most germane, the most relevant terms, devices, techniques, the ones that construct the meaning, like the, the cornerstones of the mm -hmm. commencement speech and lead with that. And typically I have them focus on three terms, devices, techniques, hence the three sentences, and then one sentence of authorial intent. So you're going to begin with the thesis, sprinkle in a little bit of context and background, and there's other little bit parts that go into this. Rhetorical analysis is kind of a geeky expository mode. So I really like it when my students use a fair amount of tier two level vocabulary. And all I mean by that is your average run of the mill SAT caliber words. So most of you know I run intensive word study academies throughout my uh, academic year and I see over time my students vocabs grow exponentially and they really uh, augment their vocabulary nicely in time and with concerted effort on my behalf. The other thing I run is something called a Nuance Academy and a staple of that Nuance Academy is Strunken White seminal text called Write It Right. And in that text, they have something called rule number 18. And they espouse that there's 12 different ways to cobble together a single sentence. So my students will be going for voice, rhythm, and flow. I really don't like it when students parallel their sentences, especially in the introduction, because it creates a droning rhythm, kind of like a da 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 da. And struggling and emerging writers tend to overuse independent clauses and short, simple declarative sentences. So I'm trying to break them of that habit. So I'm going to model how to kind of flex on the syntax tactical maneuvers a little bit. So you're going to begin with the thesis, sprinkle in some context background, tier two sentence constructs, and then the kicker, my introductory heuristics always call for four sentences. So let's do a quick little synopsis of this. Three sentences, construction of meaning. One sentence, authorial intent. I'm going to model this for you three times. Here is my first one. Noting the irony, right? So you can see I immediately dropped the term, the device, the technique, right? I think the, this, this whole thing is very ironic, right? So I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that that's the most salient, the most relevant, the most germane term. So I just drop it immediately and I'm going to anchor my thesis to that. So I'll read the whole thing. Noting the irony, Swift acknowledges as one of the most prominent wordsmiths of her generation, that this particular moment has a certain degree of inevitability. Not a college graduate herself, she rises to the occasion to nonetheless impart a few pearls of wisdom. But instead of taking the route of a pedantic bookworm, she decides to offer forth the insights she has gathered from within the music industry. Carefully delineating her advice, she underscores the things that unite her to her audience while also separating them on so many levels. So you don't always need to explicitly drop the term, the device, the technique. So as I move into that second and third sentence, one of the things I'm going to focus on in my paper is her ethos, right? She really like highlights the fact that she only has an honorary doctorate degree. She did not go the traditional route and pursue the rites of passage of the college experience, right? She pursued her music career. So that's a, an essential part of her ethos. And then the third thing that I mention is this, where I say carefully delineating, she enumerates her wisdom. She enumerates her advice, her, her, her advice. So I have irony, I have ethos, and enumeration. So do you see how I did three terms, devices, techniques? And then I have, in a sense, like the exigence, the universal theme, the universal truth in there as well. Four sentences. The vocab is up. I, I, I like words like prominent, wordsmith, ineffability. Um, words like that, right? Pedantic uh, are really nice. Underscore. 
So you don't want to totally geek out and have this idea that using a million million dollar words is the equivalent of good writing. But the vocab does need to be stretched a little bit because it's a very academic uh, piece. All right, that might be baffling, that might be confusing. So let's roll it all back and do it again. So I'm back at my canvas, back at my easel, and I'm gonna paint another one. Declarative, three plus one. Three, construction of meaning, one, authorial intent. Tier two is gonna be present. And I'm going to focus on those sentence constructs in the hopes of achieving voice rhythm and flow. Here it is from the top. Firmly acknowledging the irony that a non-college graduate has been called upon to impart a little bit of life wisdom to a collective group of undergraduates, Swift makes it clear that the knowledge she has accumulated over the years is radically different than anything one can gather from the study of books. Just humbly, humbly, someone, just, uh, sorry, I messed this up. Just humbly, someone with an honorary doctorate. She carefully enumerates the lessons from her life on the road within the music industry. As a matter of rhetorical strategy, she at first unifies the audience as a collective whole, only to later highlight the unique nature of her life's course, having not followed a traditional path. Acknowledging that learned graduates might anticipate a didactic speech, Swift breaks hard from expectation and simply imparts her street wisdom. So same thing. I'm going to focus on the three most relevant terms and pretty much selected the same ones in this. Uh, one of the things that I want to focus on if I write the rest of this essay is the fact that Swift uses a fair amount of vernacular and colloquial to really separate herself from the typical normative commencement speech that tends to be rather pedantic and bookish. Uh, she's not going to take that route, right? Because she didn't. She doesn't have a college degree, and that's an essential part of her ethos that she underscores throughout the commencement address, right? She just has an honorary degree. So you can see, you know, I highlight those three terms, devices, techniques. I got a sentence in there of authorial intent. The vocab is up. It's exactly four sentences, and none of the sentence constructs parallel one another, right? Each one's varied, each one's different, and it has a good rhythm, flow, and voice. So out of the gates, like I, I got blazing speed, right? Everything's going well. So out of the gates, perfectly perfect. All right, I always model everything three times for my students, sometimes more early in the academic year. So for all of you watching, I'll do it a third time. Blank canvas at the easel. I'm going to fill it with my words. I'm going to paint it just like Bob Ross paints with you. And I'm going to use my heuristic of the declarative thesis. Three plus one, tier two sentence constructs. In spite of receiving an honorary doctorate degree from NYU, Swift underscores the fact that she's not the right person to impart pedantic wisdom. Forgoing traditional rites of passage in order to pursue her musical career, the singer-songwriter leans instead on offering a bit of street wisdom in lieu of the textbook smarts she sidestepped. At first unifying the audience with collective pronouns, Swift later deviates from them to assert that the knowledge she wishes to opine is under very unique circumstances. Enumerating what she has uh, garnered from her highly individualistic course in life, she leaves the graduating class with a few pearls of wisdom. Same thing. Every single time it's the same thing. So my vocab is up in this one uh, as well without totally gooning out. I don't sound contrived. I don't sound pretentious. At least I hope I don't. Uh, the sentence constructs are all varied. It's exactly four sentences. Three sentences cover the construction of meaning. One sentence covers the authorial intent. And voila, that is a perfect execution of the declarative heuristic. If you are painting along with me, good place to pause and have your students uh, try their hand at an introduction of their own making. Maybe teachers, you could write a couple too to further demystify it. All right, we've still got a lot of white space on our canvas. Yeah, a lot of white space on whatever it is we're writing on, blank sheet of paper or our Chromebook screens. Next question naturally is this. 
how do I write the body paragraphs? And this, my friends, I use the heuristic of the syllogistic method that comes from the Aristotelian tradition. Aristotle ran a school called the Lyceum, and the town's boys would go there to learn about polemics, oration, debate, wordsmithing, word wrangling. And they would often throw out these juicy essential questions such as, what is justice? And some of you might be familiar with uh, Plato's Republic, in which that is the essential question. So all these philosophical think takers and scholars step to the proverbial mic and they drop their definition of justice. Aristotle noted that the, the, the students who are like the most exceptional orators had a certain mathematical computative precision to them. And us as composition teachers note that students that can keep tight lines of reasoning tend to be better writers than students who cannot. So he created a heuristic himself called the syllogistic method that he equipped his students with. And it works like this. You just basically create like a mathematical formula going from premise one, premise two to the conclusion. So if I were to say premise one, arsenic is deadly, followed up by premise two, my dog ate arsenic. We naturally conclude, uh-oh, that's not going to bode very well for you, Christian. Your dog's going to die, right? Aristotle will call that a cogent argument. It's lockstep, bulletproof, logically infallible truth, right? And when our students write, we want them to have that degree of precision uh, as far as their lines of reasoning go. So I'm going to interchange cogency and line of reasoning throughout the rest of this presentation. So how do we take Aristotle's heuristic and morph it into a heuristic for the purposes of performing rhetorical analysis? Looks like this. First premise is going to be an argument containing the terms, the devices, the techniques. And this is going to be a three-sentence move. On FRQ1 on the AP Lang exam, the College Board states a couple of times, your argument must be central. And I remind my students, and, and even when I teach teachers my methods, I remind them of this. We are engaged in an expository mode. Therefore, we are arguing. So therefore, that first premise, you know, some of you call it topic sentences or claims. Students should be arguing. And what happens is they immediately begin to plot summarize the commencement speech. And then we're not meeting the rhetorical mode. We're not meeting the demands of the assignment. We're writing plot analysis instead of rhetorical analysis. So this first premise is crucial, and I'm going to model it very carefully in just a second. But just keep in mind, it's going to be three sentences long to keep the centrality of the argument. The second premise begins in the fourth sentence, and it's just your textual support. We're going to teeter-totter balance the quoting and the paraphrasing. And then uh, body paragraphs need to be concluded. So uh, we're going to throw a conclusion on it. It's your textual analysis, and basically you're going to link and echo all back to the prompt and the thesis, right? Keep the promise of the first premise. So let's take a look at what a first premise does and is. So I'm not a big fan of sentence stems. That's why I prefer to call these heuristics and not templates. Templates I find to be a little too contrived and paint by number it stifles kids' voice a tad too much. The more you front load it, the more you're stifling. But some students ask, uh, how many, like, how do I begin or where do I begin? And I always tell them, Begin where Taylor Swift begins. Like, show your reader that you have a chronological, methodological approach through the analysis. So, go top to bottom. So, a simple, simple stem like right from the onset, comma, right? Cues your reader into knowing that you have a chronology, you have a sequence, that you're going to be organized, that you're going to have a tight line of reasoning. So, oftentimes, my students will steal that. Right from the onset, comma. So look how I highlight the terms, the devices, the techniques in chronological order. So again, this is going to be three sentences because I don't want students to do 
one paragraph tone, one paragraph, you know, diction, one paragraph ethos, one paragraph logos. That's too plodding and dutiful and it's not going to bode well for them and it definitely precludes them from getting the sophistication point. So they can multitask pretty well in three sentences and begin to link the terms of the device's techniques together in a synthesized way that constructs meaning. It's very skillful. So check this out. Right from the onset, the singer-songwriter unifies her audience with the employment of collective pronouns in order to suggest that despite the abundant differences between their life courses, there are a number of shared similarities. But in drawing these common threads, one thing remains abundantly clear. She's not a college graduate herself, hence her ethos gets drawn into question. She implicitly considers the extent to which she is qualified to deliver such an address. So in some instances, I explicitly stated the term like ethos uh, and collective pronouns. So other times you can imply it. It really doesn't matter. And again, it's sort of your your preference as the teacher as far as what you want your students to do. I don't want them to be so implicit and subtle that you know an AP reader would not be able to figure out what's going on, but everything in that is pretty manifestly clear. So now what I need to do is this, all right? Three sentences equals the first premise. I need to go quote hunting because I need quotes for the pronouns. I need quotes for the ethos, right? And that's pretty much what I promised in the first premise. And to sustain a cogent line of reasoning, you got to, got to, got to keep the promise of the first premise. So I need quotes and or paraphrases for everything that I dropped in that first premise, right? Everything needs to be germane and linked to the promise of the first premise. So let's unpack how to do that. So as I stated earlier, the fourth sentence begins the second premise. And I should have stated this earlier. Students often ask how many sentences is a syllogistic body paragraph. I shoot for 10, kind of cap it at 12. And that's for all the expository modes, right? And I'll also offer this. My students only write four paragraphs for uh, the AP exam, for AP Lit and AP Lang. All six FRQs, intro, two bodies, conclusion. That's all they do because the body, their body paragraphs, given that they're going syllogistic, tend to be bigger than those four or five sentence baggers that a lot of kids write. Um, they're more substantial. So let's get back to the fourth sentence, right? Instead of stating this obvious fact from the onset, Swift first suggests that there are a number of commonalities and that we are each a patchwork quilt of those who loved us, those who have believed in our futures, those who showed us empathy and kindness and told us the truth, even when it wasn't easy to hear. So I typically tell my students, fourth sentence begin to quote. And if you remember, the first promise in my first the my first promise in my first premise was the plural pronouns, right? So I gotta I gotta explain the we factor here because I go in order, right? Everything has a sequence. So out of there, I quoted, I have to, I have to analyze it. So look at this. The uniting thread of this is this. Not a single one of them here today has done it alone. Whether a pauper on the streets or an esteemed academic, there's a long list of people who position themselves as helpers to clear a path for the possibility of a bright future to actualize itself. But these people, just like the assembled audience, is without the shared human fate of fallibility. Nonetheless, no matter the intent or delivery, all the steps and missteps led us to this common destination, regardless of fate's unpredictable twist. Yet in saying this, Swift feels compelled to address a certain elephant in the room. She never went to college. She simply received an honor honorary degree. So do you see what I'm doing here? My pr I made two promises in the first premise. Pronouns, the collective pronouns, and then Taylor Swift's ethos. And I, I dropped pronouns first 
So in my second premise, I went there first. I dropped ethos second in the first premise. So I go there second in the second premise. So now I need some textual support for the ethos, the analysis of the ethos. And this is why she struggles when words are supposed to be her thing. Words, ironically enough, are inadequate to express the magnitude of the moment. It is at this moment that Swift deviates from the collective plural to place the focus on her unique I experience. But I'm not done, right? I got to wrap this up. I have enough support and analysis for everything that I promised in the first premise, but I got to finish the, the, or cross the finish line here and wrap this uh, syllogism up. Typically, in the conclusion of the syllogism, I do not quote, right? I'm done quoting. But in this instance, I'm like, you know, it kind of makes sense if I do. So heuristics are, are, are less rigid than templates. If a student has a reason for taking down the scaffolds or kicking off the training wheels, do it. So like nine out of 10 times, I don't quote in the conclusion of the syllogism, but this time I did, and I'll explain why. Like her audience, she used to fantasize about the normal college experience in which she would find herself imagining the posters she'd hang on the wall of her freshman dorm. But her individualistic course in life took a hard detour from these plans. This, however, in and of itself does not disqualify her from imparting a few words of wisdom that she has gathered along the course of her very unique story. So usually the conclusion takes like two sentences, no more than three. Here was my decision in, in including the quotes. I think Swift can say it better than me. And in rhetorical analysis, if I could get the author to do some of my speaking, like use their words to advance my argument, it's actually pretty skillful. It's actually quite sophisticated. And I know that all of us AP Lang teachers are preoccupied with that sophistication point, the ever so elusive sophistication point, that doing little things like that uh, bodes really well to be in contention for it. So again, if you're writing with me, pause, have your kids do their first premise, premises, uh, go quote hunting and uh, bang it all out. And then maybe uh, teachers, you can position yourself as the expert writer in the classroom and paint a few with and for your students. But we still got a whole bunch of white space on our canvas. As I alluded to, this is going to be a four paragraph essay. So what do we do next? We're done with the intro. We did one body paragraph. What do we do next? You bust out another syllogism. It's that easy. So what you're going to do is take three sentences for that first premise. And you have to take a look at what's left. We only made it to like the middle of the uh, commencement speech. We still have the middle and go all the way to the end because we're going chronologically through it. You know, just We have a method. We have a sequence. We have a chronology. We haven't talked about the enumeration. We haven't talked about her logos with the life hacks that she mentions. Uh, she switches pronouns again. I want to talk about a little bit of her colloquial and vernacular, that hard deviation from academic discourse, and then sort of that juxtaposition between book knowledge and street wisdom. So I'm going to put that stuff in my first premise when I, when I write it and align my quotes and paraphrases to those promises. So that's sort of the kind of stuff that I have left to do in that syllogism. I'm going to make it 10 to 12 sentences long, three sentences for the first premise to ensure the centrality of the argument, sprinkle in my quotes, uh, make sure I analyze my quotes and my paraphrases, and voila, I'm done. But we still have more white space. We have to wrap up the essay. We got to talk about a conclusion paragraph. I have the following poster in my room, and it's just some stems that... If kids, you know, need a training wheel or a scaffold, I have them use these. Ultimately, as the year progresses, I'm like, no, 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 cut that out. These are these are kind of contrived. They're not the most glamorous things to do. But early in the academic year, I'm totally good with stems that say things like simply said, evidentially, in no other words, when it is all said and done, 
at the end of the day. So let me show you one full one. Again, usually the conclusion takes about three or four sentences. So the stem for this one is in a global sense. In a global sense, Swift makes it really known that life has countless ways to make one wise above and beyond cracking the spines of dusty textbooks, right? So we're doing like a fireworks display here, the grand finale, really focus on theme. So the exigence, the universal truth, if you will. While the NYU graduates traversed the path of a very common rite of passage, she blazed a different life course. But nonetheless, despite the differences, she's learned a ton of wisdom by taking such a hard deviation from expectation. And that's it. That's all you need to do for a conclusion. Get in, get out quick, right? You've pretty much said it all already. You're just putting a bow on the present. So happy teaching, happy writing. That's all from me. As I already said, there's links in the uh, down below in the description where you can download the speech. It's all free. You can download the exact same slides that were in the YouTube video. Uh, if you have any questions above and beyond uh, this presentation, always feel free to reach out, teachingwritingcoach at gmail.com. Also note that I'm a lead teacher for the National Writing Project. We offer PD throughout the calendar year. Uh, you can reach out to me for that or go to my webpage, teachinghowtowrite.com. There's a link there that says my NWP courses and uh, everything's right there. And then I also got word that I'm presenting again this year for NCTE, which I'm super stoked about. So I'm around and active in the circuit. Again, please subscribe. Be well. I hope this served you well. And uh, I'll see you in the next writing workshop.